Praise the Lord. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Oh, our God, it's so good. Let's take just a minute here. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your presence here today. We prayed and asked that your glory would descend. And Lord, you did not disappoint. For you are with us. You have touched lives today. I felt the presence of your angels here. Indeed, they're here now. And I pray they would continue to minister as your word goes forth today. May people's needs be met. May their hearts be touched. May their lives be changed as you minister by your grace in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's good to be here. It's good to see all your smiling faces. And um, you are smiling, right? Uh, Okay. Um, We are continuing our series of the book of Luke. And um, today we come to Luke chapter 8. And I realized a couple of weeks ago that it was going to be my turn to preach when Luke chapter 8 came up. And I got very happy about that because Luke chapter 8 just happens to be one of my favorites. And uh, so there's an awful lot of ground to cover. So the best I can say is today as we look at Luke chapter 8, you're getting an introduction to Luke chapter 8. I encourage you to take your own time and study this word, seek out the commentaries and things like that, and and study this word and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in that study. And, you know, he will. He'll guide you. There's so much here. It's so rich and it's so powerful. So, uh, So the best I can do today, I think, even... With God's grace and the time allotted is to just give you an introduction, a brief overview. So here we go. First thing I would say about Luke chapter 8 is that it is organized in at least six sections. I think you could make a a case for eight or nine, but I'm keeping it down to a minimum. And uh, those sections are money and women. That's the first part. Then uh, parable of the seed and the sower, authority over the elements, authority over demons, authority over sickness, and authority over death. These are the uh, essential divisions, if you will, the sections of this this particular uh, passage. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. Soon afterward, Jesus began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others were contributing to their support out of their private means. Okay, this is three verses, and I could spend an hour on these three verses. Um, Matter of fact, more than an hour, I suppose. But, excuse me, the, the first thing I would say is that this is actually... Jesus' second tour of Galilee. He, back in Luke chapter 4, which I also had the privilege of speaking on, he commenced his first journey through the cities in that area. And uh, that was before he had identified the the, the 12 who were his uh, core disciples. Now, those 12 have been identified. They're traveling with him, as well as this contingent of women. And... um, So he's making this circuit around Judea, um, more specifically the Galilean regions. So this is that second tour. So at this point, I'm guessing that when Jesus headed to a town, nobody was saying, who's Jesus now? Now the crowds were gathering before he even got there because they knew who he was. They knew what he was doing. And people who had needs were lining up to see Jesus when he came to town. In what was probably very unusual for the era, Jesus had this relatively large number of women in his entourage. While the men of that time appeared to have thought little of women, they were almost an afterthought in many ways, uh, particularly when it came to uh, religious practices and uh, the governance of communities and regions Um, Jesus appears to have valued them highly and they were an important part of his followers 
You know, the, these women that are identified here, it's a seriously mixed group. You know, Mary Magdalene, we don't know much about her other than that seven demons were cast out of her. We also know that she and Joanna and possibly Susanna, although she's not mentioned, were the first people on earth to realize that Jesus had been resurrected, raised back to life, and was no longer buried in a tomb. God loves these women. And, you know, it's interesting, by the way, just a digression among many, uh, Luke 24, um, where it tells the story of these women going to the tomb. They had prepared spices, and they were going to anoint the body now that the Sabbath was over. They get there and find it empty. They go running back to tell the, dis the disciples, the great men of God, the men of faith that led the church. And those guys are like, what? I don't believe a word you're saying. You women are delusional. Um, <clears throat> I'm grateful that when I respond that way to my wife, she doesn't bring up Luke 24, you know, to me. But, um, but it's in the nature of man and woman, I guess, to uh, have these differences. Um, <clears throat> anyway, as I say, this is a seriously mixed group. Mary Magdalene had had these demons cast out of her, and we don't know really that much about her, other than the notable fact she had demons cast out of her. There's a tradition in the church that came long after the first century that uh, she was a woman of ill repute who had been uh, saved, healed, and delivered by Jesus. But we really don't know that. There's nothing in the Bible that says she was a woman of ill repute. It just says she had seven demons in her, and they got cast out. And praise God for that. So I see that. This is just me, okay? This is not the church triumphant in the world. This is not even the Disciples of Christ or a first Christian church's board of elders. This is just me. I see this as just men doing it again. Put those women under their thumb and subject subject them to the kind of ridicule that calls into question their standing in the body of Christ. Moreover, it calls into question any authority they may, might exercise in the body of Christ. So, anybody with me on that? Okay. All right, good. So anyway, <clears throat> there's Mary, Mary Magdalene. But Joanna was the wife of Chusa, who was... Uh, uh, Herod's steward. And what that really was, he was the guy who was in charge of Herod's personal finances, his own personal financial interests. This was a guy who had heavyweight clout in Judea because the ruler entrusted his wealth and his, and his income to Chusa. So Joanna came from the highest stratus, uh, stratosphere of, uh, what am I trying to say? The highest strata of society. We don't know about Mary, but Joanna was from the top. And then Susanna, whom we don't know very much about, was mentioned as well. These women obviously had some money because out of their private means, they were supporting the ministry of Jesus. Which, by the way, is interesting to me because did Jesus need them to provide support? Hello? Hello? Thank you. No, he didn't. When he needed to pay the taxes, he told Peter, go catch a fish and you'll find in his mouth the money for me and you to pay the temple tax. So um, Jesus could provide any time. When 5,000 people needed to be fed, he took, you know, a couple of fish and loaves of bread and fed them all with leftovers. That's the cool part. Jesus doesn't just provide. He provides abundantly with leftovers. Yep. So, he didn't need their support, but it was a benefit to them to support him, and he, in all his humility, graciously permitted others to support the ministry. Today, we have, you know, there are ministries around the globe. Undoubtedly, there's a whole bunch of them that geared up in the last week or two, and are pouring resources into Ukraine. And, you know, the plea goes out for us to support those ministries. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. I think that's a very good thing to do. But God never needs our money. He doesn't 
even need our labor or resources of any sort. He gave them to us, and he encourages us to use them, not because he has a need, but we have a need. We have a need to give. We have a need to humble ourselves and say, it's not all about me, Lord. Let me bless others. Let me help them. Let me meet their needs. And that was what Jesus did for these women. It's clear to me that Luke appreciated women. He saw Jesus' appreciation for them, and he, too, appreciated women. In a way that was not, uh, what, culturally appropriate at the time. And so... That's all I have to say about verses 1 through 3 for the moment. In the next section, we come to one of the most famous parables in the Bible, which is the, the seed and the sower. And you know, it really ought to be called the seed and the soil, because the variable in this particular parable is the type of soil in which the seed is sown. They had a curious way of farming at that time, which is they had a sack with a bunch of seeds in it, and they would go around grab a handful of seed and and they would just toss it on the ground and they would toss another as they proceeded along and they would just toss the seed on the ground and then they would come back and they would plow the soil over the seed that was there modern farming techniques reverse that and we plow furrows first and then we measure the seed out and we drop it right where we want it it's a much more efficient way of, of farming However, that was not what they did at that time. So when Jesus was talking about spreading this seed, they literally were just flinging it about as they went across the the ground. So let's read that real quickly, just verses 4 through 8. Now when a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the sky ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and when it came up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. And yet other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as much. As he said these things, he would call out, The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. Mark and Matthew both give accounts of the same parable. Matthew 13 and Mark 4 give those accounts. They said in those two two accounts, they said the crowd was so large that Jesus got into a boat and went out onto the water so that he could address the crowd. This crowd was big by the standards of the day. And being on a boat out on the water also helped to amplify his voice, you know, just speaking about sound. You know how sound carries over water? You know, if he was a a little off from shore, his voice would just come bouncing off the water, and people would hear him more clearly. Natural amplification. Luke says that Jesus spoke a parable. Well, what is a parable? It is a memorable story that conveys a central point. It isn't an allegory in which every element of the story conveys a meaning. Instead, it gives us one central message. Mark 4.34 makes it clear that Jesus was speaking parables to the crowd, but was explaining those parables to his followers. It says, and he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. For us, however, this is one of only a few parables that Jesus explained they, the author, Luke, wrote down Jesus' explanation of this parable so that we, too, would have insight into what this parable meant. And maybe it's a key for us as we interpret other parables as well. The, uh, the disciples didn't understand the message, so they asked Tell us what this means. And Jesus said in verse 10, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest they are told in parables, so that while seeing they may not see, and while hearing they may not understand. Curious statement here. 
David Guzik, whose uh, commentaries I really admire, he explains the mysteries of the kingdom of God this way. <clears throat> it says here, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Well, what are mysteries? In the Bible, a mystery isn't something you can't figure out. It is something that you would never know unless God revealed it to you. In the biblical sense, one might know what the mystery is, yet it is still a mystery because they would not have known unless God revealed it. In this case, it is information not revealed in the Old Testament. This is, Jesus is speaking to the people about something that is to come in the church age. And so this word and, and the way it's interpreted is, uh, is not only informational for where they were, but it provides a guide to how things will be after he is taken up. This passage, it says, so that while seeing they may not see, and while hearing they may not understand, only the spiritually sensitive would get the message. But those who weren't spiritually sensitive wouldn't add to their condemnation by ignoring the truth because the truth was hidden to them. Think about that. Jesus is giving truth to them in this parable. But if they didn't understand it, the people who had hardened hearts didn't understand it, he didn't compound their guilt by giving this mystery to them. Rather, they were protected from their own accumulation of uh, bad actions by not understanding the word. Jesus explains the parable in verses uh, 11 through 15. But I'm not going to read all that right now. Instead, I'm going to just talk about it. The key is that the seed is the word of God. The key to this entire parable is that the seed is the word of God. Once you understand that, the whole parable starts to make sense. The road soil, the, the hard soil where people were trampling the, the seed underfoot, that's the hard ground where the devil comes, like it says the birds of the air come and pluck the seed. That's the devil comes and steals it away. It's possible that there's somebody here who's hearing this message online or here in the sanctuary, and the devil is attempting to steal the seed from you right now. The word is going forth, but the devil is filling your mind with, uh, what am I going to do for lunch today? I hope I have time for a nap this afternoon. I'm so tired. Or, you know, some other distraction. The devil seeks to pluck the word away before it takes root, before it has effect in our lives. And that's that, that roadside. The rocky soil. The rocky soil speaks of dry and arid conditions. It says there's no moisture there, and so the seed fails. We need to be watered by the Holy Spirit to grow. Holy Spirit is often compared with water. Rivers of living water is what's the Holy Spirit flows through us and gives us. We cannot grow if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. I believe there are people in the body of Christ today who have withered on the vine, and the potential that they had in Christ has been stymied by their decision to not allow the Holy Spirit to flow in their lives. In some cases, they've been miseducated. In other cases, they've been willful in their desire to control the situation. But regardless of the reason, those are people who are not growing in Christ Jesus. They may have found Jesus and gotten saved, but they're like that, that old Texas Baptist I heard one time. It said, when everything else fails, just tie a knot and hang on. You know, they're just hanging on until they get to heaven. That's when they'll get the reward. And right now, they're living in a dry, arid state. That is not, brothers and sisters, how we are to live. We are to live with a constant 
regeneration, a constant new flow of the Holy Spirit working in us, enlivening us, enriching us, empowering us to overcome the world and all of its difficulties. The devil, when he looks at you, should be fearful because you are alive with the power of Almighty God. You are not just yourself, as ordinary as you may think you are when you look in the mirror, or as extraordinary as you may believe you are, you are not your own. You are a child of the living God, and as such, you are a threat to everything Satan values. You are a mighty conqueror through Jesus Christ. And if you say, Tom, I don't feel like a conqueror, I don't care, because your feelings are not what guides your position. If, if President Biden, to use an example, wakes up today and he has a migraine and he doesn't feel good, he is no less the president because he's having a bad day. Regardless of how you feel when you wake up, you are still a child of God, triumphant over the world, over your own latent fleshly desires, and over the temptations of the enemy. His false teachings, his misguidance, as it were. Well, the thorny soil, you know, in a sense, that soil is like too rich because the thorns are, are prospering and growing there, you know. Um, but what that's really talking about, those thorns, what are they? They're the distractions of the world. As it says in some translations, the desire for other things. Now, we live in a peculiar age. When I was a kid, I lived out in the country, so I wasn't in town, and I felt bad because the cool kids lived in town. You know? And uh, as I got older, I looked back on that with some irony because it was Dade City, Florida, and there was uh, 3,800 people in this little town, you know, but it, it was cool compared to where I was, stuck out in farm country, you know. And, uh, and the irony of, of ironies is that my father hated farming. He grew up on a farm, hated farming, and there we were living out in the sticks. I don't understand it. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so, you know, there was nothing to do. My parents strictly enforced uh, a no viewing rule about TV. We had li very limited time we could watch TV. And um, I thank them for that because I learned to love reading until I, in fact, learned to love sitting and thinking. My wife believes that I'm just doing nothing. But in fact, great and mighty thoughts are soaring through this mind, you know. You know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonder to behold. So, uh, <laughs> so, you know, you weren't supposed to laugh at that, you know. So, <laughs> um, anyway. But now, we live in a world where if I'm bored for a minute, I can whip this sucker out and connect with friends across the globe. I can watch videos. I can, I can do all kinds of amazing things, you know. I, I'm not sure about it. I could probably do my taxes on here, and I have complicated taxes. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing the things you can do with your phone. And so it's entirely possible to be distracted every waking minute. We have the pressures of life. We have the, you know, you've got to get out and make a living. You know, nobody's going to pay those bills if you don't get serious and get to work. You know, we have all those pressures on us, which have always existed. But now, there is no downtime because you can always find another distraction. I'm not sure how many channels are available to me on my television, but it's hundreds. The irony being that I can oftentimes come to the conclusion there's nothing good to watch. And there's hundreds of channels. It's amazing. Moreover, a lot of the stuff that is on there to watch is soul-killing drivel. So you have to be careful of that. Watch, guard your heart. Don't take in soul-killing drivel. We get distracted. And even though, you know, I am a great man of God, um, 
I wake up sometimes to the realization that I haven't spent any time with the Lord all day. I've been busy, I've been working, I've been doing all this stuff. Turns out, I'm not maybe as great a man of God as I thought I was. I've allowed the distractions of the world, the desire for other things, to impede my growth, my relationship, my fellowship with the living God. What to do, what to do? Well, what I do is I immediately repent, ask God's forgiveness for doing it again. I can't believe I did it again. And I ask his forgiveness and ask him to be with me. And we spend some time together. And it feeds my soul. However, thank God, Jesus said there's good soil, too. And that good soil is uh, those who hear the word and act on it. It wasn't enough to hear the word. It wasn't even enough to hear the word and receive it with joy. No. You know what that is? That is something that leads to putrefaction as far as I'm concerned. Jesus said that those are the ones who receive the word and act on it. Our action is necessary. I believe it was James, in the book of James, who said, you know, you tell me you have faith, well, show me your works. Because our works reveal what we really believe. If you're not acting upon the word, really, what do you believe? What's interesting to me about this is that Jesus says in this, that this parable, the key to it is that the seed is the word. And that word, as, we, as I mentioned a minute ago, was just sown indiscriminately. It's just thrown everywhere, because that's the way that they sowed seed in that time. We are very particular now, very efficient with our mechanistic age. But they just threw it everywhere, liberally. And that seed went forth everywhere. The word was the same for everybody. It didn't change. We, we, are responsible for how we receive it. Well, let's look at verses 16 through 21. This almost seems like a non sequitur that's somehow attached to this parable and its explanation. But it's not, I assure you. Now, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. And his mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Wow. We are responsible for the word that we receive and how we act upon it. Christians are not to be passive. Let me say that again. Christians are not to be passive. We are to act on what God has revealed to us. We should be the most engaged people on the planet because we have been given the words of life. The world is going to hell. We have been given life. You know, throughout uh, Jesus' ministry, it seems like his brothers 
had real difficulty with him. They didn't seem to really believe who he was who, and this claim that he was the Messiah. Just fell on deaf ears with them. Perhaps it's the problem of familiarity. He may have been a perfect big brother, but he was still just their big brother. And so they f- saw him in very human terms. And this probably didn't help them in that, at that time because, you know, if you're family, you should have backstage passes. You should be able to go right in to the green room, and hang out with everybody, you know, meet the band, all that kind of stuff. And no, Jesus wasn't providing any of that. As he said, we are members of Jesus' family if we hear the word of God and do it. That means, you know what that means? It means that you and I are the ones that have the backstage passes. We're the ones that have the all access to Jesus. Let me say that again. We have all access passes to Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, now we come to the next section where we see Jesus' authority over the elements. In verses 22 through 25, let me just read that real quickly. Now, on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? You know, Jesus says, I want to go to the other side of the lake. That's the Sea of Galilee. It's about an eight-mile, eight-and-a-half-mile trip across the lake. They set sail, and a storm comes up. I have heard, I've never been there, but I've heard that storms come up very quickly on this relatively shallow inland waterway. And they get really tough, really quick. It's interesting to me that many of these disciples were experienced fishermen who sailed on the Sea of Galilee their whole lives. So if they're scared, it's bad. And they knew their way around. So for someone, a a landlubber like me, I'm sure I would be right next to Jesus, laying down, clinging to him, saying, oh, God. uh, Be terrible. So they wake him up. Because we are perishing. That's what they said. And you know, I don't know that when they said we are perishing, that they were speaking about themselves so much as they were speaking about the group. The ministry is perishing. They're likely to all be drowned and so will go the end of Jesus' ministry. You know? So, in a manner of speaking, they may have been concerned not so much about their personal well-being as for the work of God in the world. Which I think is why Jesus, after being awake from a nice nap, uh, says to them, I imagine, somewhat annoyed, where is your faith? Do you think when Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake, that it was optional as to whether they got to the other side of the lake. If Jesus was going to the other side of the lake, where was Jesus going to be? The other side of the lake. Okay. Also, if God had ordained Jesus as the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God was the Messiah, was God so weak that a storm on the Sea of Galilee was going to thwart his plans for the world. Huh? No. Hence, Jesus' annoyance. At least, I think he was annoyed. So, 
Some theologians speculate that um, Satan caused this storm, that it was literally an attack against Jesus' ministry in the hopes of destroying him and his potential salvation that he gave to the world. But of course, as usual, where Jesus was concerned, Satan failed again. Well, we come now to the ministry of Jesus, his authority over demons, which I have to say is pretty cool. Jesus made a special trip. Remember he said, I want to go across the lake. When he went across the lake, where did he end up? Where was he now? Yeah, but what was on the other side of the lake? Gentiles were on the other side of the lake. Jesus made a special trip to go and minister to somebody who wasn't even a child of the promise. Now, had the disciples seen demons cast out of people before? Yes, they had. Where had they seen demons cast out? In Judea. That's right. They had seen demons cast out of people like poor Mary Magdalene, who were children of the promise. They were part of the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants. Now he goes across the lake. He's over in the land of the Gentiles, the Gerasenes. And when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. So Jesus gets out of the boat, and here comes this raving lunatic, naked and raving, and comes to Jesus. And he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. This is a wild scene. And I'm sure that it was wild for his disciples, and it was wild for any onlookers there in the land of the garrisons. But Jesus proceeds to cast the demons out, and they said, you know, don't send us into the abyss, please. You know, send us, how about over here, into this herd of, of swine? And Jesus actually accepts that. It's an interesting situation. But here we see Jesus uh, demonstrating the universality of his power, his authority. It wasn't just a power and authority that worked in Judea. It was for all of mankind. The whole world was to be delivered from the afflictions Satan has imposed. The man's healed of demonic torment, clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. When the townspeople come to see what has happened, they find the demonic, demoniac healed and their herd of pigs drowned. Strange events for sure, and expensive. An entire herd of pigs destroyed. It isn't all that surprising that they would ask Jesus to leave. They didn't understand who or what Jesus was. You know, John 10.10 says that Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. By killing a huge herd of swine, the demons stayed true to their master's ways. The townspeople wanted Jesus to leave, and he immediately answered their request. He, the healed demoniac wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus told him to stay and proclaim what God had done for him. Can you imagine how much more difficult it must have been for that man to stay amongst the people of his hometown? Everyone knew him as the crazy guy who caused them to lose their herd of pigs, which was their livelihood, and Jesus wants him to stay among those who were the least likely to trust him. What did this non-Jew do? 
verse 39. He obeyed. It seems sometimes that those who don't know Jesus have the easier way. But in the end, obedience to God's will pays dividends that have eternal power. It's extraordinary to me. Well, now we find Jesus' authority over sickness. And I realize that time is marching on, so I apologize. But I am bound and determined to get through Luke chapter 8 today, so bear with me. Verses 40 to 48, Jesus returns to Galilee across the sea, only to find the crowd waiting for him. Pretty good thing that he got that nap before he got back, huh? Exhausting to deal with these people. Jairus comes to him. He was uh, a ruler of the synagogue, it says in some translations. In the New American Standard, it um, says he's an official of the synagogue. And he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. Jairus was an official of the synagogue. More likely what he was was an administrator who looked after and attended to the daily you know, running of the synagogue. Which made him a person of some significance to the local scene. You know, I mean, the synagogue was the, the center of Jewish life. And he was somebody who was, you know, of prominence in the synagogue. So it's a notable thing that he shows up here for Je- and asks Jesus for help. So, Jesus says, okay, and he goes with him because Jairus asked him to come to his house. It's interesting, the Roman centurion that we saw earlier, he says, don't even bother coming to my house. Just speak the word and I know that my servant will be healed. That Roman centurion had greater faith than Jairus did. Jairus was operating out of the tradition and understanding of his people. The Roman centurion was free of that and just approached Jesus on Jesus' terms. Isn't that cool? May we be like the centurion. So anyway, Jesus heads off with Jairus, and they're heading to Jairus' house, where his 12-year-old daughter is, and she's dying. And along the way, a woman comes along who for 12 years has been suffering with an issue of blood. This is, uh, by the way, we're talking about like a menstrual flow that just never stopped. And this made her impure and unclean, according to Jewish law. She really wasn't even supposed to be in the crowd because just by being there, she was corrupting the crowd. So, moreover, not only is she in a crowd, and that crowd was pressing so tightly in that it was nearly suffocating. In the Greek, the words here about pressing in, the crowd pressing in, are the, is the word used for suffocation. I mean, this crowd was like, you know, intense in, in their desire to be near Jesus. But somehow or other, she makes her way through, and she says, if I can just touch his robe, I know that I'll be healed. This woman had great faith. A lot more faith, by the way, than Jairus had. And he was the official from the synagogue. He was the guy who's supposed to be all about that. She is the woman who is impoverished by 12 years of suffering and yet, and is an outcast, if you will, from the, from the people. But she said, if I can just touch his robe, I know I'll be healed. Praise the Lord for women of faith. So she does. She touches him. In fact, I think when it says a fringe, it says, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. Well, you know, the outer garment of Jewish men at that time, and some today, has these tassels on the corners of the garment. And so my guess is that she grabbed a hold of one of the tassel on the back side of the garment there, and she was instantly healed. It's interesting. Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, are you kidding me? Everybody's touching you. you know? and <clears throat> but he knew that power had gone out from him, that someone with faith had touched him. The other people, they touched him, sure. I touched this microphone, so what? What, they, what this woman did, she touched Jesus with faith. And that faith set her free. When you come to Jesus in faith, 
it sets you free. When others come to Jesus in faith and you agree with Jesus and you pray for them, it sets them free because you are the vessel of Jesus in that moment used to touch them and set them free. We, as the children of God, are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be the very ambassador of Jesus Christ in this world. And when you pray in faith for others, you set them free. Praise God. Hallelujah. We have victory in Christ Jesus, and we don't have to put up with all the lies of the world and the devil. We have victory in Jesus. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, man, I get so excited about this stuff. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus knew someone was healed. He called her out. You can just imagine. He turns around. She's trying to hide. And he sees her and says, you, daughter. A term of endearment that, by the way, is not recorded anywhere else in the Bible. Jesus called her daughter. He loved her. He told her. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This is important for so many reasons. But principally, because when doubts might arise later, you know, God does something for us, and then later the enemy's saying, that didn't really happen. You know, you're just fooling yourself. That was just emotion. It's not the truth. God doesn't work that way. And frankly, he doesn't care about you. You know how bad you are. I've seen Satan steal miracles from people, and it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. Prayed for a woman and her husband at their home with some friends of mine from Living Water Church uh, two years ago now, just before COVID. The woman's crippled up using a cane and walking like this to answer the door. Her husband was terrified, living with anxiety and fear came in there. We started praying with them, just praying in tongues. Didn't know what to do, just started praying in tongues. When you don't know what to do, pray in tongues. Praying in tongues for a little while, 15 minutes or so, four of us, and all of a sudden, I knew what to do. So at that point, laid hands on the guy. We all laid hands on the guy, cast out spirits of fear, anxiety, worry, all this stuff, and he got set free. He was joyous and, and happy, and I just began sharing the word with this woman, just telling her, how much Jesus loved her, and that healing was God's will for her. And you know what? She didn't even notice it. She didn't even notice it when we got up because they wanted us to do a house cleaning, you know, pray for every room of the house, so we're going through the house. She didn't even notice that the cane was still sitting by the chair, and she was walking along with the rest of us like this, you know. She was gloriously, mightily healed. God did a wonderful work that evening. I think it was a Tuesday, uh, in that family. Called up my buddy Rick Thompson, who's the pastor of that church. Said a couple days later, I said, how's everybody doing? And he said, well, that same woman came over to the church a couple days later, was mad about something or somebody, and got very bitter about people in the church. And you know what happened? She was right back to using that cane and doing this. She let it all go. She allowed bitterness to steal from her the great work of God. Had two good days and right back to it. How sad. You can lose the blessings of God if you believe the lies, the whispers, the deceitfulness of the devil. Don't do that. So, this woman... When the devil would come back and say, you know, it didn't really happen. You know, you're really still sick. She had the assurance from Jesus himself. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Moreover, Jesus didn't just confirm her healing to her. He confirmed her healing to the crowd. They knew now that she was not unclean. In fact, she was another welcome member of society. Finally, she came up to him behind him and just said, if I can just touch him, you know, I'll, I'll be healed. He confirmed to her that she stole nothing. 
She stole nothing. Her healing was an act of divine love given to her by God. Okay, Jesus' authority over death. Well, you can imagine how Jairus might be feeling right now. Um, his daughter's dying, and they're going to his house so that Jesus can heal his daughter. And instead, Jesus was from southern Galilee, because here's another digression, you know, in the story. That's a joke. So, um, anyway, they're going on the way to Jairus' house, and here's this woman who got healed. Jesus is now attending to her while Jairus' 12-year-old daughter is at death's door. As they proceeded along now, after this delay, servants come to Jairus and say, don't bother the master. She's already died. Jesus was undeterred, but he did tell the faithless mourners that were there that they were wrong. He said just two things to Jairus. One, do not be afraid. Two, believe. Just believe. That was what Jairus needed to know, and it remains what we need to know in our times of despair. When things look like the whole world's caving in on you, it may be the world really is caving in on you. I'm, sometimes it's not just looking like it, it's really happening. There's people in Ukraine right now, their world is caving in on them. For real. But the same two things apply. Do not be afraid. Believe. We have Christian brothers and sisters in Ukraine and in Russia and in Belarus, all these nations there that are involved in this current uh, conflagration and the word is the same for all of them whether you're a Russian mother whose teenage boy has been conscripted and sent to Ukraine to fight a battle they were not thinking about or you're a Ukrainian who just watched your apartment building be blown into rubble or you're somebody from Belarus and the dictator there who's a puppet of Putin you know, has just declared that you're going to send your family to go fight in Ukraine. Dear God, what a horror. Do not be afraid. Believe. I pity those who don't know Jesus because they are bereft. They're in a hard place with no answers. But for a Christian, do not be afraid believe is the message for us and wherever you are today whatever's going on in your world do not be afraid believe Jesus has paid it all every need has already been met the fact that you haven't seen the manifestation of it yet doesn't change a thing Jesus closed the door on those faithless mourners and only allowed the girl's parents and Peter, John, and James to enter the girl's room. Now, you know, a lot of people assume that, that Jesus brought in Peter and James and John a lot of times because, you know, they were like the inner core, the special amongst the special. You know, this one quarter, 25% of the 12 disciples was Peter, James, and John, and they were the elite. However, consider this other option. James and John were known as the sons of thunder, and we know how Peter could be. Dem very demonstrable, very quick to judgment and to action. It's very possible that Jesus invited them in just to keep an eye on them. I mean, really, think about it, you know. We think, oh, these, these great disciples. Those great disciples were the ones that caused trouble everywhere they went. So, uh, you know, Jesus may very well have said, you three, I'm not leaving you alone. Come with me. So, <clears throat> he then demonstrated the power of God over death itself as he spoke to the dead girl and said, Child, arise. Jesus walked into the death room filled with mourners and displayed his authority over the crowd over death itself and Satan's dominion in the world. Jesus' authority was great, but his love and compassion were and are greater. 
when the girl got up, Jesus immediately told the crowd to find some food for her. It's like, come on, let's pay attention to this little, little girl. Let's take care of her needs now. And in a way, it was like taking the attention away from the great miracle that he had just done and turning that attention to attend to my daughter here, my child. And how cool that Jesus just loves that much. David Guzik notes, Jesus didn't fail Jairus. He didn't fail the woman who needed healing. But in serving both of them, he needed to stretch the faith of Jairus extra far. In all of this, we see how the work of Jesus is different, yet the same among each individual. If Jesus can touch each need this personally, he can touch our needs the same way. Jairus had 12 years of sunshine with his little girl that were about to be extinguished. The woman had 12 years of agony that it seemed hopeless to heal. Jairus was an important man, the ruler of the synagogue. The woman was a nobody. We don't even know her name. Jairus was probably wealthy because he was an important man. The woman was poor because she spent all her money on doctors. Jairus came publicly. The woman came secretly. Jairus thought Jesus had to do a lot to heal his daughter. The woman thought all she needed was to touch Jesus' garment. Jesus responded to the woman immediately. Jesus responded to Jairus after a delay. Jairus' daughter was healed secretly. Remember at the very end of this passage, her parents were amazed, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. The woman was healed publicly. So we come to the conclusion of chapter 8. Quite an epic word. Conjoint. The... uh, The message has gone forth. The word never returns void. Power has been displayed here today in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The power of the word is touching people's hearts right now. And you have a choice. The word could land on good soil. The word could land on stony ground. But the word has gone forth. If you're here today and you have a need, I tell you that there's power here to meet needs. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, if you've not entrusted your life to his care and keeping, it's high time that you did. There is no better deal than receiving salvation for your sins from a loving God who paid the price for you that you deserve to pay yourself. Oh, Lord, touch the hearts of your people. Draw them close. Lord, we just lift up to you every person here and those online as well. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to them now, whatever their need, whatever their circumstance. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it's as easy as this. If you speak it and you mean it, say, Father, forgive me. I need a Savior. Please, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Wash me clean. Take me as your own. Permit me to serve you. Save my soul, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. That simple prayer is the difference between death and life, eternal life. And if you just received that through that prayer, then you know that something just changed. And if you're online somewhere and uh, not here in the room, we welcome you to call us, let us know what's happened, because what a joy for all of us to know that another member of the body of Christ has come into the light. And if you're here 
and you confess Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and you've got a burden and some trouble today, it's time to lay that down. Jesus came to carry those burdens for you. If you're still carrying it, my question is, why? Jesus paid it all, and there is no burden too great for him to carry on our behalf. So I welcome you to come as the band plays. If you have a need, we're going to pray for you, and God's going to minister. Simple as that. It's a guarantee. Come.